Hello there, welcome to my channel. Welcome back if you've been here before. My name's Gary and I'm an ordinary bloke doing stuff. Today, I'm gonna to show you this. I've bitten the bullet, I've finally gone for it and I've built the 172nd scale Avro Vulcan B2 from Airfix. It's a monster of a kit. 277 parts, a lot of which are bombs I have to say. Uh, but a great, great kit to build, but there's so many things to look out for along the way. I can remember clambering around the inside of the bomb bay of one of these as a cadet, so I'm hoping that the kit brings back happy memories. Now remember, I don't do this for competition, I don't do this for museums, I do it for fun. I'm just an ordinary modeler like, I suspect, the majority of you watching this video. It's an expensive thing, this kit, but I tell you, it is well worth building. We'll have a quick look at the history of the Vulcan, then we'll show you what's inside this huge box, and then I'll show you how I made my Avro Vulcan. The Avro Vulcan was created in response to specification B3546, for a four-engine bomber with swept wing, capable of carrying a 10,000 pound bomb, cruising at 500 knots at at least 55,000 feet. A design team, led by Chief Engineer Roy Chadwick, designer of the Lancaster bomber, and Chief Designer Stuart Davies settled on the Delta Wing as the best solution. Tragically, Chadwick was not to see his design take to the skies, as he was killed just a few months later as a passenger in the prototype Avro Tudor II airliner. Because of the bomber's radical design, Avro built the one -third scale Type 707 research aircraft to study the Delta's characteristics further. Two 707As for high-speed research and two 707Bs for low-speed flight. Most of these flights were conducted by Avro's chief test pilot, Wing Commander Roly Falk, who really did fly in a suit and tie. The bomber's design, now called the Type 698, continued in development and two prototypes are authorised. The first of these, VX770, flew on the 30th of August 1952 at the hands of Roly Falk. Continuing development was aided by wind tunnel testing by the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, which identified issues with the straight-edged Delta Wing. The second prototype, VX777, was fitted with Bristol Olympus engines and a fighter-style control stick, as were all subsequent aircraft. The second prototype was also modified with a new wing with a kinked and drooped leading edge, curing the issues highlighted in the wind tunnels, and this wing was used on production aircraft. It was in the second production, B1 Vulcan, that Roly Falk famously performed a barrel roll at the Farnborough Air Show, earning him a stern rebuke from the authorities. The first Vulcans became operational with 83 Squadron RAF in 1957, part of the V-Force that also included the Handley Page Victor and the Vickers Valiant. The V-Force carried the UK's independent nuclear deterrent, each aircraft armed with a single bomb, with aircraft and crews on alert around the clock. From the 46th aircraft onwards, all Vulcans were made to the B-2 standard. This had a larger, thinner wing, electronic countermeasures and in-flight refueling capability. Later B-2 aircraft would also carry the Blue Steel rocket-powered standoff missile, its 900 km range reducing the exposure of the Vulcan to enemy defences. Improved Soviet high-altitude air defence led the RAF to redesignate the Vulcan as a low-level strike aircraft in the 1960s, a role it provided until the Royal Navy took on the provision of the nuclear deterrent with the first Polaris-equipped submarines in 1968. Thereafter, the Vulcan reverted to its secondary role as a conventional bomber. With an internal load of 21 1,000-pound bombs and good low-level manoeuvrability, the Vulcan was a success in many exercises, notably in the Red Flag series flown in the Nevada desert. Ironically, perhaps the Vulcan's only operational use 
was in the Black Buck Raids on the Falkland Islands in 1982. Seven missions were flown, each taking more than 12,000 kilometres and 16 hours in the air. At the time, the longest range attack missions ever flown, requiring numerous in-flight refuelings from a fleet of Victor tankers. The Vulcan continued in RAF service as the B-2 low-level strike bomber, the MR-2 maritime reconnaissance aircraft and as the K-2 tanker aircraft. The Vulcan was finally retired from RAF service in March 1984. The RAF maintained a Vulcan display flight until 1992 when the last flying Vulcan XH-558 passed into private hands. After seven years of display flying, XH-558 was finally grounded on the 28th of October 2015, the last of 136 Vulcans to fly. This model from Airfix is rated at skill level 3, partly because it is so big, but also there are some quite fiddly pieces in here. The kit also comes with a token for four flying hours. As an FX club member, you can collect these towards a free kit in the future, or you can donate them to Models for Heroes. A link to this excellent charity is in the information box below. Let's crack on then and see what we get in the box. Straight off, you certainly get an impression of value for money with this one. First of all, here is a sheet of decals, loads of them, printed sharply and with very good colour. The common decals at the top here are the instrument panels, some brown dielectric panels for electronic equipment and so on. Then we have the markings for Scheme A, an aircraft of 27 Squadron RAF. This is the one with camouflaged upper surfaces. We also have the markings for Scheme B, an aircraft of 12 Squadron RAF, with the pale anti-flash markings and the all-over white aircraft. Finally, we have the decals for the stores, some stencils for the blue steel if you're having it, and the live round rings for the conventional bombs. Next in the box is the instruction booklet, very typical airfix, clear and well drawn. And then we have the colour and decal layouts for Scheme A with the camouflage and Scheme B in the all over white. Then the stencil placings for each scheme. Again, the stencils are different colours for the two marking schemes. I'm using Scheme A for my aircraft, but I'm making XM607 of 44 Squadron as she was seen at Red Flag in 1977 with desert camouflage on the underside. I've got some extra markings as a decal set separately. Then we get onto the actual parts which come in various plastic bags. First the huge wings, then there's a sprue for the blue steel missile, one for the control surfaces and rudder, then the main internal structures, one for the fuselage and bombs, then one for the engine bits and undercarriage. Oh, and this tiny one for the transparencies. Looking at the parts, there is obvious scope for reboxing later. My aircraft needed this late model fin top with the radar warning receiver. I thought I'd have to go aftermarket or scratch build it, but here it is. So expect a late model B2 in the future. Maybe another Falklands Black Buck release, perhaps. There are other extras, including various tail cones, nose probes, engine exhausts, etc., already in there. So if you're doing a late model aircraft with the Olympus 301s, for example, the bits are probably already in here. Nice to see 21 £1,000 bombs as well. Now the wings are huge. Here's a Spitfire parked on one of them for scale. You are going to need some room to build this. Anyway, that's what we get. Let's see how I put it all together. We start as always with the cockpit section. Here I'm fitting the walls of the nose gear well. The top of that is the floor of the cockpit. Then in the cockpit itself goes the throttle quadrant. Now, I should have put the decal on this first, but I didn't. 
this is followed by the rudder pedals then I can fit this forward bulkhead which holds all the structure in place. I've painted the instrument panel black so I can apply the decal as normal. I've added a bit of decal fixing solution and I can slide it easily into place. When it's dry, I can put the instrument panel into place, then attach the control sticks. They kind of hook around the bottom of the panel. Neat having fighter control sticks for such a big plane. I'm going to start painting the ejection seat inserts first, a kind of cream color. I'll add the straps and buckles later on. The seats come in two halves. I'll add some leather to the armrest before I fit them. Then the painted seat inserts go in. The personal survival pack on the bottom is yellow and I've done the straps and the buckles. Next these side panels go in, creating a quite snug cockpit. At the back of the flight deck are two fire extinguishers I've painted red with brass fittings. Then I'll fit the flight crew ladder into place. After all that, we have the positions for the other three flight crew members, radar navigator, navigator plotter, and air electronics officer. Note that while the flight deck had ejection seats, the lower deck didn't, and the crew here would have to escape through the entry hatch. With the seats in place, the rear pressure bulkhead can go on. I can now fit the rest of the instrument decals. The side panels are easy enough to do. But here you can see I really should have done the centre console earlier. Still, got there in the end. I'll leave the cockpit assembly alone for a while now and address the nose weight. Airfix has very helpfully supplied this kind of pot for the inside of the nose. It requires 40 grams of ballast. I use diving belt weight pellets, but anything, fishing weights or anything like that are good. I tend to flood the weights with white PVA as well, so they are held in place when they're dry and don't rattle around. When the PVA has set, I can glue the weights to the front of the completed cockpit section. Now I do wonder why I do stuff sometimes, I suspect it's for completion, but I did put this tiny ceiling instrument decal on the inside of the hood as instructed. The only time you'll ever see this is if you have the hood as a removable item, which means you'll have chopped up the transparency as the windshield wasn't removable, and then you'll have painted the inside of the hood already, da 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 da. In fact, most of the cockpit is not visible once it's built. So why do we do it? Who knows? Back to the instructions, and there are these tiny observation windows to go into the side of the nose next. I use white PVA to hold them in place, and a bit of blue tack on a toothpick to place the window itself. With the windows in on each side, the cockpit section can go into one side of the nose assembly, then the other half is joined to it. Tape it all up and leave it to set. And while it's drying, you can fit the nose cone. The underside of the nose section has the bomb aimers window. Usually it was actually fitted with a camera for release point images and the crew entry hatch. I'm going to put a bit of tape over this. I'm having the entry hatch open and I'm going to be spraying the bottom of the aircraft. So a bit of tape like this will protect the interior. When those are in, the lower nose panel can be fit in place. Finally to the top of the nose section and the canopy itself can go on. Again, I use PVA glue for this. Make sure it sits well in place and leave it, preferably overnight, to really bond. And with the nose done, I can move on to the main structure of the aircraft. Now, if your Vulcan's going to be carrying a blue steel missile, you need to cut off these small pieces of spar here. There are several spar cross members to make for the top of the bomb bay. All the parts have big numbers printed on them so you can see in which order they go and which way round. There are three cross members and six vertical pieces. 
Next I will connect up the walls of the bombay to these ends and these form a box that defines the bombay. The cross members can then be slotted into their places. The three I've assembled plus two more moulded on the sprue. Next there's another spar that goes in and connecting the ends of these three spars is another box member and this forms the structural support of the wing. Again for the blue steel there are areas that need to be cut out before we go on. There are also some 1mm holes that need to be drilled for the ECM aerials later on. The lower surface of the wing then attaches to the box frame. Now I found this a bit tricky to line up and get everything connected. For the other side of the wing I used a few dabs of super glue as a kind of spot weld to hold everything in place then used polystyrene cement for the final fix. While that dries I'm making the nose gear well. I pre-painted the insides and added a bit of detail wash. The well goes together like a box with the roof of the well used as a bottom form. Likewise the main gear wells can be assembled. When they're all set the undercarriage wells can be glued into the lower wing section. The next job is making the engine intakes. Airfix supplied templates for the inside of the intake to show the extent of camouflage paint. Beyond this the intakes are white. Of course if you're doing the all over anti-flash white you can ignore this. With the line drawn from the template I can mask off the painted white portions and add paint to the inside lips of the intakes. Next there is an intake splitter, also white, and at the back the engine fan discs painted in steel. FX3 kindly supplies FOD covers for the engines. I'm using them, I've painted them red and they go in now. Then I fix the top half of the intake and set it to dry with clamps. When both intakes have set up they go into the lower half of the wing section. Again they're held in place with clamps while they dry. There are also a couple of lights to go into the lower wing panel. Here I'm going to put them in place and then just add a tiny spot of ultra thin glue. Now for the upper half of the wing, formed from two pieces. I use super glue to tack them together, secure them with tape and then use ultra thin glue to set them into one piece. Then finally I can set the two halves of this massive wing together. Clamps and tape will hold them in place while they set. After all that drama I need something gentler to do so I'm fitting my paint masks to the transparencies. I'm using a pre-cut set, Edward CX604. It's simply a case of identifying the piece, taking it off the backing with the tip of a sharp knife and placing it on the plastic. Once those are done I'm going to add the nose structure to the wing section. It goes together really very well. Next is the tail cone. There's a hole you need to drill later if you're going to do the scheme B as it's on the joint I tend to mark it then drill it later. In any case the two halves of the tail cone go together and this cooling vent is fitted to one side. Then the tail cone can go into place at the back of the wing section. Next are the exhausts for the engines. Each pipe has a number of notches in it here, 1 and 2, which is the engine number. The top of the exhaust shroud has a corresponding number.
Each engine has two more parts again numbered. Here for engine 1 we have the port and starboard sections. The diagram in the instructions makes it quite clear. There's this alignment ring that fits over the end but don't glue this in place as it has to come off later. I've used a bit of thin masking tape to hold it in place as it isn't a tight fit. Then fit the small shroud pieces around the exhaust pipe. I found this irksome to say the least. I tried fitting them with the pieces sitting upright, it seemed a little easier. When they're done, take a breather, let them dry and then do the other pair. This faff really cries out for an aftermarket resin version. For each pair of engines there's a plate with the turbine printed on it. This fits into the exhaust body. There are a couple of 1mm holes to drill for the ECM plate as before. This assembly and its opposite number get put into the rear of the engine bays, then the nozzle assemblies finish them off. Then there are some exhaust vents for the engines. These simply glue into place on the underside. Out of interest I've used normal glue on the front ones and the ultra thin on the rear ones. And the ultra thin really does seem better. Next are the plates for the ECM suite. We drilled holes for these earlier on. First there's this support fin that goes onto the back of the plate and then some support bars that get attached to the engine covers. Then the ECM aerial plate can go into place. Finally for this the inlet has a fuselage fillet that slots into place on either side. Next up is the fin and as I've mentioned I'm using the radar warning receiver version kindly provided by Airfix. For the box schemes you'll use the rounder version. The fin itself comes in two halves that glue together then the fin tip glues into place. The fin then sits into the top of the tail section. The huge rudder again comes in two halves, join them together, then the rudder can be slotted into place at the rear of the fin. Then the main control surfaces. Each wing has four elevens that have combined functions as elevators, ailerons and flaps. The inner elevens are in two pieces each, the outer elevens are single pieces. The outer elevons also have actuator fairings. Now I'm going to let all that alone for a while so I can start on some other chores. First I'm going to start on the wheels. 16 main wheels and 2 nose wheels. When they're dry I'll put them together as their pairs. Then I'll start on the bombs. There are 3 bomb racks. Each has a row of 4 bombs at the top and 3 at the bottom. 3 racks of 7 bombs each. 21 bombs in total. Next I'll make a start on the undercarriage legs and the main gear. The main strut comes in two pieces with a bracing bar at the top. FX seem to have included the safety bar used when parked which is nice. Anyway the gear leg is painted black apart from a few spots of steel. Then this small bar goes in place at the top of the bogey then the wheel sets can be glued into place. I've sprayed the top of the fuselage grey all over, then I'm adding some PVC adhesive masks for the camouflage before spraying with dark green. I've got a set for the top and the bottom as the underside is sprayed US Earth Yellow and UK Dark Earth. Next I'll start on some of the decals on the upper surface including the roundels.
I've brush painted the bombs in UK dark green. They each get a yellow nose ring to indicate live rounds. They do look pretty impressive when all together. Now to fit the undercarriage. Now make a note here I've forgotten to put the rear part of the gear door in first. This makes things a little bit tricky later. However I've put the main gear leg in with the actuator frame at the front. For the nose gear, fit the wheels in place, then fit this brace plus the actuator arms to the leg. Then fit the whole thing into the front end of the wheel well. Back to the main gear and the side door can go into place. There are two door actuators on each side that go in too. Now here I'm putting the rear door in, but I've had to chop the mounting down a little so I can't hook it into place. Lesson learnt, I think. You put it in before the gear, okay? Anyway, I got it to fit finally. The nose gear has its own two doors, one on each side, and each has an actuator arm. Then the underside extended air brake goes into its slot, one on each side of the aircraft. Then I can fit the bomb racks into the bomb bay and very satisfying they look. The bomb bay doors are folded together, then they fit into the top edge of the bomb bay sides. When all the lower parts of the kit have dried in place, we move back to the top. The extended upper air brakes go in, two on each side of the aircraft. Then I'll go round the fuselage, fitting the various antennas. I've opted for the open crew door, so I fit the ladder to the door. Now, there are a couple of small handrails missing here. One was broken in the kit, and the other lost in a cat in the workshop incident. Next on is the refueling probe for the nose, and that completes the actual building. My last job is to take the masks off the cockpit. Now, if I use a strong light and a special lens, you can see how little of that internal detail is actually visible. Anyway, sometimes we do it just because it is there to be done, and it makes us feel better. A quick go around touching up paint, and my Vulcan, I think, is complete. I can't say it's an easy build because it isn't. It's skill level 3 just like the Lancaster and that seems about right. It demands a lot of patience but it is well worth the effort. This will be a great seller for Airfix for a few years to come. Now if you've enjoyed this video, maybe even found it useful, then why not subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and there you'll find other builds, other projects and all sorts of other goodies as they're completed. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. <music>